Cashamaniacs. Welcome to all of you watching live through the Google Plus Hangout on Air, watching this video later on YouTube, or downloading the audio version from the Cashamaniac site. I'm the Bad Cop with Daryl W4, and we're back for this 37th edition of the Geo Gearheads. Tonight we're doing a show a little different than usual. Uh, we call this episode Randomize. Rather than just one subject for the episode, we'll be talking about a number of different topics, some from you. Others from interesting topical items like the announcement season we're coming out of right now. It's been an interesting announcement season indeed. Uh, much of the press, of course, has been around the iPhone 5, but there were announcements from other smartphone, smartphone manufacturers and other products like cameras and even some gaming consoles. I'm interested in many of those, but really the smartphones are, I think, what this audience would be most interested in hearing about, so we'll talk about those a little later. Uh, we have a number of comments and even some instructions from our listeners first, but next week we have one of our listeners from the Bad Cops home state who caches under the name The Winter Trio to talk about uh, waypoints versus POIs versus paperless. Of course, we'd love to hear your thoughts on which one is best and you know whether it's best to use uh, waypoints, POIs, or the paperless caching features. So write in those through social media or by emailing us at geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com. Better yet would be to call them into our voicemail line at 206-350-3647. Now, the Winter Trio was also kind enough to email us with some follow-up to the GSAC episode. He says, I just listened to the GSAC episode, and thanks for reading my email. Listening to someone else read it? I wish I had written it a bit differently. It didn't really come across as I intended, at least to my ears. Now, Daryl, isn't that always the case? It amazes me how someone else's voice can change the tone of a message. Indeed it does. And that's why we like it when you call in your comments. Now, back to the email. He says, I love GSAC, and I use it consistently, and I'm sorry, constantly, constantly and consistently for just about everything geocaching related. I've written quite a few macros and a number of local Thomas Guide challenge maps. I also export my field notes from Geosphere and use the API to publish all the logs. I've also loaded it up with a database of astronomical objects, galaxies, nebulas, star clusters, etc., and that must be a database of astronomical proportions. And keep all my personal logs of what I've seen in there as well. This process for Geosphere to GSAC, uh, I'm sorry, he says, his process for Geosphere to GSAC, for the Geosphere GSAC, it took a while, a little trial and error to find the correct format, but it works great. Yeah, and he was kind enough to send an email with his uh, complete workflow of taking the field notes from the Geosphere uh, into GSAC and logging it from there. Rather than trying to read that out on the show, we're going to drop that text into the show notes, and that's really going to be helpful for anyone using uh, GSAC and field notes. So head over there to cashamaniacs.com for that. Uh, and you know, after uh, uh, logging all the caches for the day, it's really not that tough from uh, what he's saying. It just takes a few steps and getting used to it. Yeah, I need to try that myself. I read that and thought, well, that makes a lot of sense. I just had a bunch and. You know, went and did them manually on the uh, website. So I've got to I've got to try this procedure next time I go out caching. Yeah, I'm not much of a, a GSAC user myself, though, so uh, not something I'm going to be uh, trying anytime soon. Mm, there you go. Well, we got more feedback from Google Plus. Dusty wrote, "I also use it GSAC for stats on my profile and to weed out caches that are still active but have a lot of DNFs." I have a database for my local area and some other towns around me. We also heard from uh, Wet Coast, uh, who's a uh, Google Plus member, and sent us a, a comment that he'd or a topic that he'd like us to talk about, which was how long do you search for a cache mm -hmm. before you file it as a DNF, or do you not file it as a DNF, just decide to come back another day? 
And that was actually a conversation that was happening over on uh, Google Plus a little bit, and Nighthawk700 uh, actually responded to that uh, post and said that, uh, as a cache owner, I'd like to see your DNF log with a little bit of what you tried. Someone recently contacted me about a DNF of one of my caches four times over the past month. I had driven by the cache a few weeks ago. This one was near my old home quite a distance away and could have gone to check it out then. I'll have to see if I can find someone in the local area to take a look. As a finder, I'll log a DNF because sometimes the cache owner will give a hint, and I do on some of my DNFs as well. I had a certain cache two times and DNF both. The cache owner told me I needed to approach it from the other side. I went again, and do it's right there on the other side. <laughs> so I, I don't know about you, but I like to... Uh, uh, do DNF logs, but it, it really varies a lot on the cache, and maybe we'll go into that in a little bit, but what's your thoughts on that? I, I agree with you. DNF logs are important, but it depends on the situation. Uh, to me, DNFs are very situational. Uh, one of the acronyms I like to use is ROOT, ran out of time. I won't do a DNF if i you know looking for something, and look, oh, I've got to go, get a phone call, have to leave. Okay, I didn't have enough time to search. I don't claim that as a DNF, but that's personal. Also, it depends on the situation. If it's dark, I probably won't do a DNF until I can get back there in the light of day and look for it again. Or, you know, if I'm just tired of getting rained on, because, you know, it rarely rains here in the Northwest, but when it does, uh, I'll even go out caching then. And if I get tired of rain, being rained on, I'll just walk away and come back another day. Yeah, that is a, uh, a couple of good areas that, uh, you know, you just, you don't want to log a DNF if it's something that you just gave up on because you don't feel necessarily that you've given it uh, mm -hmm. uh, the full try. Anytime I'm out there, do a good job of searching, especially if I've gone and looked for the uh, uh, hint and made uh, adjustments to what I'm searching for based on that hint, that's when I'll go and log the DNF. If it's something where I'm out there and I go, you know what, I, I'm just not feeling like I'm on my game tonight, or if it's uh, you know too many people around, then I'll log a DNF. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I'll do sometimes if there's a lot of people around is actually log a uh, note that, mm -hmm. hey, I was here you know during the day, you know like uh, one or two, whatever it would uh, have been on a weekday, and this place is hopping just too many people around to mm -hmm. even try it. That way, if someone else were to try for it, they might you know, know to uh, kind of avoid the area around that time as well. But the DNFs only go for caches where I'm pretty sure I've given it everything I can and haven't been able to find mm -hmm. it, or if I've found bits of the uh, cache, so I'm pretty sure the cache has been uh, destroyed. Right. So you log a DNT rather than a DNF, did not try. Right, right. <laughs> well, and one of the problems that uh, we actually ran into was uh, is one of the areas had been bulldozed. So Oops. it's kind of obvious the cache is gone if the right. area had been dozed. Yeah. And I've come up and found the logbook, you know, strewn in the grass. Okay, I'm not going to claim it as a find, but I know it was there. It needs maintenance or it needs to be archived. Yeah, yeah. There, there's all kinds of uh, reasons to DNF a cache mm -hmm. that are legitimate, and you know, a lot of uh, new cachers will log DNFs and then get turned off because mm -hmm. they're kind of berated for logging so many DNFs. You know, either you know by uh, fellow cachers who are just intending to kind of you know give them a hard time, or right. by uh, some cache owners who are getting annoyed with uh, DNFs from cashers who just might not have the experience. So it, it's kind of a balance, uh, you know, especially when you're getting started, you know, to know when it is that you want to DNF a uh, cache. Mm -hmm. So you know, it, it is one of those tougher things, and it is really just kind of a judgment call on a uh, cashier by cashier basis. But it is very important that if you truly believe that that cache is gone, to log that DNF. Because if you don't go and log that DNF, the cash owner is probably not going to notice it. And right. one of the big problems we have locally is people will go and hit these caches and not log the DNFs. We've had a number of these things that we've gone for 
where it's pretty obvious the cache is gone. Mm-hmm. You know, not just because of a bulldozer, but maybe like the lamp that it was on or likely to have been on has been removed or, uh, you know, a tree that uh, mm-hmm. fell down, got knocked down, whatever. So it's obvious that that happened, you know, good time ago, whatever it might be. And there's no DNF logs on it. And other people have hit the uh, uh, area. So you kind of figure that uh, some folks have been out there, but there's no DNF logs. So how's anyone going to know that this is a cache that needs to be checked on by the cache owner, potentially archive, maintenance, whatever? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, my German side of me says, I will find this cache. I won't give up until I find it. One, I looked for a good half hour. After 30 minutes, I feel I've covered the area everywhere it could be, and I didn't find it. I'll log a DNF. Uh, the other one I looked at that I logged a DNF on recently hadn't been logged in four months. Now, I know people have been out there. The area looks trampled, but nobody was willing in the last four months to log a DNF. Yeah, and that's a big problem is that people just don't log mm-hmm. DNF, so no one knows. And it, it really depends, though, because sometimes I'll give it five minutes of hunting, and I know that the cache isn't there and log the DNF. But if it's something you know, a little bit more tricky, you know, I'll mm-hmm. spend an hour, I shouldn't say an hour, because I almost never spend that much time looking for a cache. <laughs> but you know, I'll, you know, I'll might spend a half an hour mm-hmm. more looking for a cache and not convince myself that I've exhausted all options, just figure you know, it's something that we're not going to find today. So I don't bother logging the DNF. Oh, you know, Daryl, you bring up a good point, and it goes back to DNFs are conditional. If it's a one difficulty cache, I'm not going to spend half an hour looking for it. In 10 minutes, if I don't have it in my hand, I'm done. Yeah, uh, I was looking for a four difficulty cache. Okay, I'm going to spend more time. It's obviously a difficult hide. He wouldn't have put the the cache owner wouldn't have put four stars if it was just you know, sitting under a lamppost. So I'm willing to spend more time to look for it. Yeah, Uh, yeah. So, you know, it depends. And there is no shame in putting a DNF. You didn't find it. That's okay. No, and it does give you a good idea of what to go back and hunt for later as well. So Mm -hmm. don't be afraid of putting the DNFs if you've given it a good hunt and you are Mm -hmm. convinced that you gave it your best shot and it's not there. Right. You know, maybe you need a, a hint from the cash owner. It's a good way to do it. And I, I've actually run into cash owners who will say, I will not give a hint until the person has logged mm-hmm. at least one or two DNS on the cash. Mm-hmm. So it's you know, some cash owners have kind of gotten it in, uh, into their routine that that's the way they'll go. I even ran into a cacher who set up an automated system where if you email a DNF or if you email a... Uh, hint it will Mm -hmm. give you two different options and it's just an automated system you set up where you know it goes and looks for the gc number in the subject and if you say hint in the uh, Mm -hmm. uh, body i think it was it goes and sends you uh, improving hints so that you can kind of get a feel for it or if you dnf it says you know well you know check here it gives you like a little bit different type of hint okay so yeah, you know, he's he's encouraging the uh, DNFs directly, but it, you know I thought that was a great idea. That gives me an idea for a puzzle cache. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so back to this original conversation between Wet Coaster and Nighthawk Seven Hundred. Wet Coaster comes back and says, "Thanks for your comment. I seem to be having a large percentage of DNFs, one in four or five searches, and I just don't know that." And, and I just don't know that I'm not finding it because it's been muggled or because I just don't know what I'm looking for. I've had only one CO reply to me and give me a hint to where to look. I, I was about 10 feet away. From now on, unless it's a time constraint on the search, I'll file a DNF when I just can't locate the cache. The undergrowth around here can be quite thick in this area, in this part of the Pacific temperate rainforest, southern BC portion. And, you know, that's exactly true. I know I've hidden a cache, and I went back to look for it. I don't know. Uh, Somebody said they couldn't find it. I went back three or four months later after I hid it, and I could not find it because the growth had come out so much that, you know, I had to get back in there with a machete and and 
hack out the spot where I hid the cache. Oh, nice. Yeah, well, that that goes to another good uh, point is cache owners, if you get a DNF, it's not a bad idea to email that uh, uh, finder and say, hey, uh, you know, what's happened to this, that, mm -hmm. and the next thing? Exactly. And it opens up a conversation. Perhaps you'll make a new friend. Exactly. Well, why don't we move on to uh, some of the new devices that have been announced recently and... We'll start with the obvious one, which is the iPhone 5. That did they does, announce that? Uh, yeah, they, they did. Oh, okay, good. And it does make some dramatic <laughs> changes, but in many ways it's uh, not all that different. So people are uh, uh, getting all bent out of shape, you know, it's not enough and, you know, whatnot. But I, I have to say that the more I'm hearing from a lot of the uh, iPhone users that I've been talking with, the size of it is really... Um, a big deal for some people. Like my boss, who's mm -hmm. a big, tall guy with big hands, really was whining because he doesn't want a bigger phone. And he's now saying that the iPhone 5 might be too big, and he's looking at uh, the, uh, well, we'll talk about it in a little while, but the Razer M, which is supposed to be a smaller phone, just because he doesn't want a big phone. He's using okay. his phone more often than as a smartphone. Mm -hmm. So he wants that smaller screen. He wants it more portable and he's getting annoyed with the uh, uh, size creep on the phones. So I, th I think that that's a big deal. But let's talk about that. They've taken the iPhone 5, kept the same width, mm -hmm. so it's not any bigger in your hand really, extended it about 9 millimeters. And by doing that, they were able to get a bigger screen in there. So it goes from, I want to say it was a three and a half inch screen to a four inch screen now. Exactly. And they're removing some of that bezel above and below. So they've gotten a bigger screen in there. It doesn't have the, um, the pixel density, or I shouldn't say pixel density, the density is still there, but it doesn't have the pixel count that you'll get out of a lot of the new Android phones. Right. So it is lower resolution, still a great screen, and everything I'm hearing is that the screen is incredible compared to uh, even the previous generation uh, 4S. And that's in part because they've switched to a new type of uh, touch sensor on the uh, screen, and it's actually now built right into the screen. Exactly. It's integrated into the glass itself of the screen. Yeah, it's called an in cell. Uh, touch panel or something to that effect, but mm -hmm. Incel is the technology. And this is uh, something that really is going to make a big difference because the way that used to work is you had to layer on another piece of glass or plastic in the case of a lot of them. And that, number one, it's another layer that you have to go through, but it also meant that there was room for slippage. And that's why a lot of devices have that calibrate screen to correct mm -hmm. for any of that uh, uh, you know, variation that you might have just from use or whatever. Right. Uh, the iPhone actually glued those panels together so that you didn't have any slippage and it was calibrated at the factory and done. But I, I really love this whole idea of the incel because it does reduce the amount of glare. It does reduce the uh, amount of uh, potential errors in you know. Mm -hmm. All kinds of stuff just really gets simplified when you remove parts. So I really do like that. Yes, I agree. Um, I think it's going to be an okay phone. Uh, one big disappointment for me was no NFC. That's near-field communications. The only reason I'm interested in near-field communications is because of Munzee. Yeah, that's not <laughs> something that I ever expected Apple to put in. Uh, Apple's been... Uh, fairly, uh, I don't want to say down on NFC, but they just have not expressed any interest mm -hmm. in NFC. And a lot of it comes from the fact that Bluetooth 4 does most of what uh, people want out of NFC, but according to some of the experts I've heard talking about it, it takes like a quarter of the power when it's active, and when it's not active, it takes almost no power, and NFC apparently has been causing a lot of problems on some of those devices that have it right now. So Interesting. I had not hear, just, heard that. 
Yeah, just like they uh, held off on LTE, because a lot of people were expecting the iPhone 4S to have LTE in it. Mm-hmm. But at that time, LTE took a lot of power, required multiple chips, and now the iPhone 5 has LTE, but it's one chip mm-hmm. for LTE everywhere that it supports LTE. And then they just have different, I think they called it uh, dynamic antennas, but they, in the uh, phone itself, the phone hardware, they're just switching the antennas depending on which band it is. So -hmm. they don't have to have a ton of different uh, phones. They don't have to worry about it. And and because it's one smaller chip, supposedly they're getting much better power efficiency. And this phone is almost exactly the same battery specs as the previous generation, even though it does have a bigger screen Mm -hmm. and has all of the extra stuff, including LTE. Yes, and one of the features it has is a brand new dock connector. Yeah, that's that's actually been causing a lot of uh, turmoil. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) One, they picked a lousy name for it. They called it Lightning. Thunderbolt and Lightning? Very, very frightening. They already have the uh, Thunderbolt (laughs) name, and the Thunderbolt... uh, has a lightning symbol as its uh, designation yeah. on the computers that have the Thunderbolt. And boy, if they had Thunderbolt on this phone, I'd be all over it. Why is that? Thunderbolt is essentially PCI. Mm-hmm. So you've got this really high bandwidth connection that allows for all kinds of expansion. You, know, you could get uh, you know, a little external uh, Ethernet, a uh, modem, uh, you know, you can actually get uh, PCI card slots, you know, external chassis that support mm-hmm. PCI cards. Can you imagine how cool that would be <laughs> if you had that level of expansion on a phone? I mean, it's just insane. But you could also load up that phone in like, you know, the 64 gig phone would probably load up in all of about 10 seconds if you wanted to do a full load of all 64 uh, or I said megs, but 64 gigs. Right. You know, Thunderbolt is just bloody fast. Yeah. Hook it up to something like a uh, megabit or even a, a 10, or sorry, gigabit or a 10 gig connection. Upload your uh, music. Be done. Well, yeah. And it, think about phone to phone. If you wanted to uh, clone your phone to another phone or mm, something like that. Go. Yeah. Just the, the, options that you'd have with a Thunderbolt connection would be insane. But it is expensive. It doesn't make sense that they would have put it in there. It just would have been handy. But with Lightning, we would have expected that it would have been maybe USB 3. But at this point, it's not. Now, that's not to say that Lightning won't later on support it. But currently, it's a totally different, much smaller connection. One of the advantages that they're touting is it is a reversible connection. So unlike the dock connector, which you Mm -hmm. had to get it in just right, this one is smaller, supposedly easier to get in, and it doesn't matter if it's right side up or upside down. You just have to get it aligned in the right direction. And it looks like a little card slot, almost like a a, a SD card or something to that effect. So it is uh, an interesting connector. I'm annoyed because... It doesn't work with any of my old stuff. They no. do have an adapter for twenty nine dollars, thirty dollars yeah. cable for thirty nine dollars. Problem is, not every thirty pin dock connector uh, accessory is compatible with this new dock connector. Right. The new Lightning connector is, uh, I want to say, nine pins. Eight, I thought it was. Yeah. Well, it's eight pins plus it has a ground. Well, sure. So they, you know, they're calling it a nine-pin connector. It, it's all digital. There's mm-hmm. no analog anything. Anything that you have that's an analog out, you know, that required in uh, line out or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, some car stereos, some yep. of the uh, boombox kind of things, apparently are not going to work with this. Uh, new lightning to 30-pin connector. But we don't really know because we haven't seen a whole lot of official information. It's kind of been uh, skimmed from information that they were given in the interviews after the uh, press event. So I don't have a whole lot of uh, information that you really, you know, gather what's going on. No, my understanding is anything that, you know, 
you plugged into the 4S and below for audio isn't going to work with this. Now, you're probably not going to be able to use the Bad Elf GPS. Yeah, that's one of the questions I had because uh, it is digital, and my impression was things like the Bad Elf D GPS, the Wahoo Fitness Key, mm -hmm. are probably going to work. And some of the audio stuff will actually work too. If it's doing digital audio, it will work. But if okay. it's doing the analog audio, it won't. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I have a, uh, oh shoot, what's the name of it? It's one of the iHome products that's actually a, just uses your standard USB cable out of the 30 pin dock connector, and that will work. Okay, that will work. That's all digital. Mm -hmm. According to what I have seen. Again, we don't know for certain. This is mostly informed speculation. Right. And so, the impression I got is many of the uh, adapters uh, or many of the devices will work like the uh, GPS adapters. No one's ever said one way or the other, but my impression is they might work. They're probably going to release a new camera connection kit. I'm sure they will, but that's so. not going to happen most likely until... The new, new version iPads. of the iPad comes out that has it. And that's something to note is all of the new iPods are going to have this new connector mm -hmm. as well as all of the new uh, iPods. And, you know, everything is going to be switching to this. And they did release right. some new iPod touches. That was one of the really disappointing things because some of the rumors that we had seen indicated that the new iPod touch was going to include a GPSR. Oh, I well, hadn't heard that. that. Didn't I didn't expect yeah. it to. Um, I I thought there might be a chance with the Nexus, including the in Nexus mm -hmm. Seven, including the uh, GPSR, and that's such a cheap device. It's two hundred dollars. You get a GPS mm -hmm. built in, and that's what they're asking. It's two hundred and fifty dollars for the smallest of the. Uh, but that's iPod still touches. the old generation. Right. Correct. Correct, but at, you know you're talking fifty dollars more, and it doesn't have a GPS. So I thought maybe there was a chance we'd yeah. see the uh, GPS it, included it, this time around. They've got this loop connector on the back of the new iPod Touch, which leads me to believe they're pushing it more for almost a consumer camera. Yeah, it really does look like that's where they're going with it, and I do like that idea. But they need to improve that camera a little bit more. Yeah, it's, yeah. if it's going to be used as a camera, you have to have better uh, zoom capabilities than right. what it currently has. Right. You know, whether that's digital or optical, I would prefer optical, of course. And, well, that actually gets us into the uh, new Lumia cameras, or uh, phones. Uh, mm -hmm. Lumia, or Nokia, announced the Lumia 920 and 820, and there was a whole kerfuffle on that because they're <laughs> uh, uh, faking their footage that they were showing on uh, the websites. But the Lumias are based on the uh, Windows uh, Mobile, um, Windows 8, Windows actually. 8, right. Or Windows Phone 8. And their big uh, claim to fame is the uh, Pure View camera, which has actual optical stabilization. Mm -hmm. That means the actual camera components are being stabilized physically. It's right. not trying to simulate it by shifting pixels around to exactly. stabilize the image. Exactly. So now, you can get a much better quality stable image out of those. Do you know if that's uh, mechanically stabilized, like with a motor, or is it just fluid? From what I understand from, again, very bad interviews, <laughs> uh, it, it sounds like it's uh, just suspended by springs. Okay. But I'm I can, sure I consider that a fluid work. type mount. It's it's going to flow yeah. with the camera well, rather than the, being mechanic or uh, I, I want to say mechanically um, motorized. Well, from what I could kind of gather, it the entire camera in these pure views is uh, suspended. It's not like in your DSLRs or in your uh, camcorders where they're just stabilizing the optics and have to go through a whole bunch of sophisticated routines. This one, I wouldn't be too surprised if it actually just has a little uh, gyroscope motor hmm. and then it's suspended by springs because that gyroscope will help keep it you know, mm -hmm. from doing too much. Yeah, I really don't know and unfortunately haven't seen anything that 
really hints at it too much, you know, especially because the uh, optical stabilization had been faked in their videos, and that's all anyone's ever talking about now. Exactly. So the actual information about that device seems to be disappearing in favor of all of this, you know, well, Nokia faked it again, and this is not the first time they've done it. So, you know, the little bit that we've seen of actual images mm -hmm. out of these look very nice. But we don't really know because apparently they couldn't shoot the videos with the final version of uh, Windows Phone 8 because it's not been completed. You know, the camera, right. the camera SDK is not available. So they're unable to actually give you a good idea of what this is going to be capable of because it hasn't gotten to that point yet. However, they're expecting to ship these things by the end of the year. Exactly. So I, I have this nasty feeling that they're not going to make their target with them. But I well, really do I don't like, know. I don't know. If, if you know, Unlike Apple, where it's all under one roof, this is Nokia has to rely on motor or on a motor. <laughs> on, no, they have to rely on uh, Windows, you know, on the Windows uh, development mm. team over at Microsoft. So once they get that SDK, then they can start working on the software to actually drive this thing. So I, I don't know. You know, my, my guess is uh, it might be delayed or be released without everything being completely uh, enabled. It's going to have like basic functionality instead of the full functionality. Well, now we can say that the Lumia, uh, at least the 920, is using the same processor as the Galaxy S3. That's the Snapdragon S4 from Qualcomm, dual-core processor. Uh, it does have a gig of memory, internal memory to work with, uh, 32 gigs additional on the phone, and no external SD card. Yeah, that's, that is a big problem. But this is really the only of the uh, announcement that's uh, hit in this batch that I really found anything interesting in because this is the next generation of Windows phones. Mm-hmm. Windows Phone 8 looks like it might be a good alternative. It might actually take off. And the hardware looks like it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And this is the first Windows Phone hardware we've seen that really has much promise in years. You know, mm -hmm. since they went to the new tiles and everything, this right. is the first one that really looks like it might be a contender. So I'm really excited about it, and yet it looks like it's going to be the last one to ship, and by the time it does, I'm sure we're going to have new phones from HTC and from uh, Samsung. Right. Yeah, and Motorola did announce uh, three new phones. Yes, they did. Yeah, all of them uh, with uh, availability unknown, but the this Razer year. M. Yeah, the mm -hmm. Razer M was the first one to ship and is actually in people's hands now. And the cool thing about that Razer M is it's a small phone. Mm -hmm. It's designed for people who want that smaller phone. Like I was talking about, my boss really doesn't want the big phone. You know, a lot of people with small hands are complaining that even the iPhone is a little bit too big for them. So this is one of those phones that's designed for people who want something a little smaller. And the interesting thing is this is actually an Intel processor from what I'm hearing. Exactly. Now, the size on this screen is 4.3 inches, so it's still going to be bigger than the new iPhone 5 coming out. However, it's smaller than all the other current uh, Android smartphones. Well, it's, you know, it is some of the Android phones that I've seen are pretty small, but they're the really lousy ones with like... Right. Three inch screens and I, I don't consider like those a, a current cities. smartphone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're still releasing some of these they're, old phones, essentially. Exactly. They're still for sale, but I would not go that way. Yeah, exactly. You know, so with, this is a current a phone. Thing. It's got some uh, serious mm -hmm. oomph. And if you know, here's the thing, though. You know, and these are great phones from everything we've seen. I don't happen to like the motor blur, moto blur, moto blur. What? Moto yeah. Blur, yeah. And I really don't like most of the skins that uh, the manufacturers throw on these yeah. things. And What were they thinking, putting anything with the word blur? I don't yeah, want anything no blurred. <laughs> no kidding. It, yeah, that's just not very good marketing. <laughs> but at this point, I don't want anything interfering with my Android experience. Right. So I do, and 
Moto Blur is one of the ones that really bothers me. It really gets in my way from the little bit that I've played with it. Granted, I haven't lived with one of these things to really get used to it and mm -hmm. know how to use it, but my impression has been, no, get this thing away from me. Right. Uh, Sense I can actually work with, and yeah. I've uh, played with the uh, HTC's, uh, or uh, Samsung's, uh, um, oh, shoot, what is it? Actually, it's maybe Samsung's Sense. What's HTC? No, then? HTC is Sense. Okay, H yeah, that HTC is Sense. Um, but the uh, Samsung one, which I can't remember what it's called now, yeah. I really don't like it, but I can live with it. Right. My wife has a feature phone. It's not a smartphone, but it has HTC, HTC Sense on it. So it feels like an Android phone. Yeah, there's a lot of cool things about so. the uh, HTC skin, and it really does make some sense, especially if you've got uh, a variety of devices. And one of the things that uh, was brought up on one of the Android podcasts I listened to is that Sense actually was originally on some of the Windows phones. So if you were using How'd Sense... How they manage you, that? Well, it was actually uh, more of an architecture at the time that allowed you to uh, sync with non... Uh, exchange servers. Okay. So okay. by doing it that way, he was able to migrate his address book and various other things uh, around to Android and to other platforms. So he really is a fan of it for just the flexibility that it gave him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But getting back to uh, uh, the Motorola and Motorola. Uh, phones announcements, they introduced a new Razer HD mm -hmm. and the Motorola Max HD. Mm -hmm. So for cachers, you're really probably going to want to look at that max. It doesn't really increase the size very much. I've, Not at all, actually. It's only a millimeter or two. So why they even came out with two phones is kind of beyond me. Well, the difference is the battery. The max has a bigger battery. Right. But why? if you have only a millimeter difference in the size, uh, why not just come out with a one phone and be done? Well, it's marketing. Yeah, well, I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it's something like they just they had to have it because the uh, the you know the extra millimeter made it the thinnest phone at the time, or Could it be. made it uh, the lightest phone, or something Let's to see that. See if I can find anything on the okay the battery on the Max. Okay, the battery on the Razer HD is twenty five thirty milliamp hours. On the Max, it's thirty three hundred milliamp hours. So that really does, that's an increase. You know, oh, it's we're, a, we're a third increase. bigger. Well, so the thing it, that's really disappointing is the Razer has battery life subpar. It's ridiculously little. You pretty much mm -hmm. have to keep that plugged in from everything that I'm reading uh, if you're actually wanting to use that. The Max has battery life you know, comparable to other uh, Android smartphones in mm -hmm. that arena. If you're getting something like the uh, Galaxy, you're going to get good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going to get uh, good uh, battery life out of that. You can get the extended batteries, and this is going to be comparable to that. Maybe a little better than the standard battery, but uh, again, if really what it comes down to is, if you're interested in a motor blur for phone, you have two new phones that you can look at. Uh, the uh, Razer Max HD and the mm -hmm. uh, Razer M as good alternatives uh, you know, for your next caching device. Exactly. Now, what other was kind big of news. really interesting, though, was they announced a $100 trade-in program for any phones available in 2011 or 2012 that are not going to be upgraded to Jelly Bean. What I found really telling about that is the phones that they had in that listing when they actually uh, did the form. Mm -hmm. And some of those phones that are going to be left with whatever is currently on them, currently on them. maybe ice cream sandwich, is very, very disappointing. And looking at that list, it really makes me not want to get a Motorola phone. Well, the one big advantage is the news break that Google has purchased Motorola. Indeed, but they've said that they're not really going to touch it. And this has been one of my problems with most of the Android phones, and apparently it gets a lot into dealings with the carriers. Mm -hmm. The carriers don't really want these phones to be upgraded. They'd rather have the phones to be sold with whatever it has, mm -hmm. 
you know, be a stable phone and be done with it and force people to upgrade if they want uh, if the they latest, want the... greatest software. Right. You know, and go through, you know, cause they have to go through all the QC checks and everything else. So about the only Android phone that seems to be getting the uh, newer software on a uh, fairly consistent basis are the Nexus phones from Google, which makes some sense. Exactly. But it, it really is kind of steering me back to getting the iPhone because uh, Apple doesn't deal with the, the carriers in the same way, and they just release the software, and everyone has it the same day pretty much. That's true. But, you know, I'm hoping for better integration between the phones and the software with this motor with this Motorola purchase from Google. Now, I wouldn't it, count on it, that because again they have that I uh, moto blur I and agree. they're still going through all of the extra rigmarole. But one of the big goals of the Android team has been to diminish the uh, difference in time between the release of a new version of the software and the release to the customers. So they're mm-hmm. working with carriers more. They're working with the manufacturers better. So hopefully we'll see that uh, time decrease in you know, the availability of these updates improved. Yeah, and a lot of what I'm uh, uh, looking at is we have some software starting to come out now that is not available for some of the older uh, versions of Android. So it's very important that you get at least ICS at this point. And right. some of those phones are still being released with gingerbread. And that is what really, really bugs me about mm-hmm. a lot of the Android phones right now. Yeah, do a little more quality control. Let's release a, a updated operating system on the new phones that you can buy. Yeah, well, and Jelly Bean is really brand new. I can certainly understand why oh, right. these phones aren't being released with uh, Jelly Bean. But what bothers me is some of the uh, Hero phones, the really high-end phones from a year ago, mm-hmm. aren't going to be getting Jelly Bean. That I find really, really disturbing. Mm-hmm. Well, at least you get $100 out of it if you trade yeah, in. It's a hundred dollar trade in, but you know. Does that cover your question, early termination fee? Well, and my question is, uh, you know, is the carrier going to give you the contract price or not? Mm, good point. Because phones without contracts are stinking expensive. At least here in the U.S. Yeah, good point. You know, so, uh, overseas it's a little bit different story, but here in the U.S., you pretty much have to buy a phone on contract. Now. Let's talk about another device on contract that seems quite affordable. And these are the new Kindles. Did, yeah, did you like that segue? Was that good? That was pretty good. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the interesting thing with the Kindle Fire HD 9, yes. is what that what they call it? The 9-inch the screen, the 8.9-inch screen. Uh, is they the, just call it the HD. HD. No, well, there's, there's two HDs. There's a 7-inch and an 8.9-inch. No, the 7-inch is an HD. Well, there's two different sevens. There's a seven-inch HD, and there's a. Uh, <laughs> I think I okay. You uh, win. I'll go, I'll go back and double I'm check. A, I'm going to go look right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's a Kindle Fire. Yeah, there's a Kindle Fire HD seven-inch, and yep. the eight point nine inch four, and they have an eight point nine inch and an eight point nine inch H or uh, LTE or four G something. I've, ah, right. I'm well. Okay. Okay, so we go with the paper white, which is just a reader. Wi-Fi capability, you're done. I well, guess there's, there's one three. Of the, yeah, one of the interesting things to uh, note with that uh, paper white is they've eliminated audio now. So mm-hmm. no longer can you listen to your audio books, which is a, a big uh, issue for a lot of people, and it won't do the text-to-speech because okay. there's no audio. So that, okay, the next step up then is the Kindle Fire HD. This is your 7-inch tablet. Well, they still have the 7-inch Kindle Fire that they've dropped the price on, but and they've improved the specs on that. But I really, really, really advise anyone who's looking at a 7-inch tablet to not look at the Fire. Yeah, it I just agree. It doesn't make sense. If you want it as a reader, it's going to do a great job with some light web surfing, maybe some email reading. But if you're looking for a tablet, well, if you're a Geo Gearhead looking for a tablet to geocache with, I wouldn't go this way. No, they, the Nexus 7 is an awesome tablet. 
Uh, I haven't heard a whole lot, but the people who have been going out with it really do like it, and it seems like it is a lot better than a lot of the 7-inch tablets mm -hmm. that we've seen before. And you have so much uh, wider functionality with the Nexus 7 than you do with the Kindle. Mm -hmm. And the new Kindle Fire HD, even the 7-inch, does have a camera, but it's lacking the GPS, Right, and it's locked down to the Amazon apps. So if you're an Amazon user, you want to do the Amazon uh, uh, movies, the music, that kind of thing, it is a Perfect. great option for that. But think of it as just a media consumption device. It is not a full tablet. Right, you know, It has some of the tablet functionality, but if that's what you're looking for as a tablet, you're going to probably be a whole lot uh, happier with the Nexus 7. We've just lost any chance of Amazon sponsoring the show, haven't we? I, I'm sure we have, but okay. I don't think they were going to anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so the next step up after that is the Kindle Fire HD 8.9 inch. Right, which is and pretty much just the uh, same thing, just bigger screen, better little bigger processor. I, can, I consider it a real iPad competitor. It's It's cheaper, but again, it's locked down to the Kindle store. But the iPad's locked down to the Apple Store. Yeah, but the difference is that Apple's trying to get it a broader base. It has mm -hmm. more functionality. You have the option of things like a GPS on there, and you don't with the uh, uh, Kindle Fire HD at all. Now, where not they even, not even the 4G version. Correct. And where that really makes sense to me is that 4G version. If you're looking for a surfing device. If you're looking for something to check Facebook, if you're looking for something to do tweets, if you're looking for that kind of stuff, this might be a good option because that uh, Fire with the uh, 4G service is only, uh, what was it, $50 a year? $50 a year for 250 megs a month. Which just blows my mind. Exactly. That is Ultra cheap. Now, the problem is it's only 250 megs a month. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to download anything with that. You're going to be going over your limit really quickly. However, if you're looking for something to just yeah. grab, you know, tweets, grab your email, grab, you know, a little bit of information here and there from web surfing, this looks like something that really, really, really could be an awesome deal. You know, think of it just as something that you take in the field to do your logging. Right. If that's what you're looking for, to check on your information. I seriously doubt if you're just looking up cache pages that you'll be going over that 250 uh, meg limit. Right. I think that's the audience they're looking for, the casual user. Not, you know, maybe not a geo gearhead, but uh, a casual user who's going to look at it as a reader with some other functionality. Indeed. Now, you know, I'd really love to go on and. Uh, uh, talk about our next topic that we wanted to hit, which is the uh, Munzies. But it's getting a little late, and uh, my cats are starting to really bug me. So I think we probably, uh, <laughs> I think we should probably call it quits, and we'll move on to the uh, Munzies in a, a later show. Sounds good to me. Now, don't forget that next week we're going to be talking about uh, uh, waypoints versus POIs versus paperless caching. So you'll want to join us then. And if you have any comments or questions. Yeah, you know, this or next show, uh, go ahead and uh, you know send those in to us. You know, you can check the Cash Maniacs show. Uh, go ahead and uh, you know send those in to us. You know, you can check the Cash Maniacs website at cashmaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes from this and all of our fantastic episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by calling 206-350-3647, by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com, or through social media. Your support helps, helps keep the Geo Gearheads and the Cashamaniac shows coming. Please consider making a PayPal donation through the link on our website to support the Cashamaniac shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Umfenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. This show is copyright 2012 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved. <laughs>